webinar. Um, today we have with us um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Jens uh, Nedruth. Hopefully, I pronounce uh, my pronunciation was correct. Uh, Jens is um, principal uh, PE is the manager of electric systems planning at Puget Sound Energy. Currently, he leads a team responsible for the development of PSEs, transmission and distribution delivery grid enhancements to meet customers' future energy needs. He has over 18 years of experience in the utility industry where he has worked in non-wires alternative development, grid modernization strategy, DER integration, transmission and distribution planning, substation design, and large-scale transmission project management. Jens has worked on more than 100 infrastructure projects and specializes in developing modern creative solutions that ba balance technical, regulatory, and community needs. He received his bachelor's and master's degree degrees in electrical engineering from University of Washington and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington. Thank you so much, Jens, for uh, speaking with us today. And uh, Jens will be talking to us about an industry perspective on the future energy delivery system challenges to support decarbonization and electrification, including opportunities to utilize complementary energy solutions. So back to you, Jens, and we'll get started. I'm gonna make you talk about as fast as I do, which is fantastic. So no, thank you for the opportunity. Happy, happy to be here today. Um, yes, I'm a Husky, but I'm I'm fully supportive of Cougs. As long as you're not a duck, that was a win in my book. I was in the marching band for years and spent many times at Apple Cup games. So I know great camaraderie, but I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk and really give an industry perspective on where we're at from a planning standpoint, where we're going, um, what we can do to really broaden our horizon, thinking about how we deliver energy to customers and not just electrons uh, and where we might have some interesting opportunities moving forward. So um let me see make sure the sharing piece works if you can see that give it a second maybe a long second um we'll get there so i'll, I'll talk today a little bit while that's loading about uh, some of the challenges that we're facing in the delivery system um, how the clean energy targets are really uh, ramping that up and and uh, driving forward with um, a number of aggressive uh, targets that we've got to hit i'm going to share that a different way Okay. Oh, maybe it is coming. Fantastic. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. I'm using PowerPoint Live for those that are, are on, on the computer. So you can you can even flip through on your way if you as, as we go. So can you see that the slides now? Yes, we can. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Um so we'll we'll spend some time today talking about what delivery system planning means. Um as Anamika said, I'm Jensen Nedrin. I manage a team of about 45 engineers at PSE. And we study the system looking at uh, long range planning for transmission and distribution on the electric grid. We've got a team to focus on asset management and asset health as we move forward with that as well. Where are we seeing risks and, and, and potential damage in the system from an asset health standpoint? And then a whole other uh, set of team that looks at distribution planning. How are we enabling better resiliency and reliability as we move forward on the grid and meeting our future capacity needs? So we'll spend a little bit just making sure we're grounded in where what PSE is about and where some of our issues are seeing today. We'll talk what delivery system planning, what that term means to us at PSE and, and how um, we're really broadening that from an industry perspective, thinking about pipelines and wires. You're hearing me say a lot about pipelines and I'm an electrical engineer by trade, not an ME, but I've learned a lot more about gas in, in the past few years and how that may help address some future energy challenges. Um, and then we'll talk through an urban case study. We're having some challenges even today that we're seeing in Redmond, Washington, and what are some of the creative opportunities we can do to address that. And even some areas, uh, we'll end by really talking about some areas where I think academia and the research institutions have a role that they can play in helping to shape this moving forward. And we'll have some time at the end for questions. If you've got a burning question along the way, feel free uh, to chime in and I'll, we'll, we'll manage those as we go. So to get started, PSE is in the northwestern part of the state of Washington. Right, you almost think the Puget Sound Basin where we've got Seattle, Tacoma. Um, we serve a little over 1.2 million electric customers and almost eh, a little shy of a million natural gas customers. Um, key piece to think about and some numbers just to give you a sense of the size and scale. We've got a little over 5,000 megawatts of total generation capacity. That's both owned and contractual. But the next line, and I added this just for this talk, we usually don't talk about these details, but I appreciate um, how people in the industry will, will be able to re respect and understand that. We're about a 5,000 megawatt winter peaking utility and now up to almost 4,000 megawatts summer peaking. Um, and that summer peaking one really ratchets up quickly. So um, today we'll talk about the size and the scale of the problem that's facing us uh, and how those numbers almost double in the near future to help us meet the electrification goals, really focusing on what that's going to mean to our, our delivery network of, of pipes and wires that help do that. 
So we'll start by framing up what is delivery system planning? How does it work? How do we think about it at PSE? And where does it really fit all together in the other planned spaces that we've got to manage as a utility? Um, delivery system planning is, is there on the lower left. And really that is all of the pipes and wires that take the power once it's been generated and deliver that to customers. Um, that includes all your long haul transmission, right? To bring it across the state. It also includes your, your transmission and distribution wires that connect to all each and every home and business and really customer that we serve. Um, it's directly integrated with a number of other planning processes that a utility has to, has to manage, right? Um, there's a whole set of work that happens around resource planning, making sure you've got the right resources to manage that. There's a whole other set of, of work at PSE really driving for what are different customer products and services that help meet our electrification goals that we have to account for and how our new technology around grid modernization going to help shape that. So I wanted to make sure we understand that because those are all the other inputs, so to speak, that we've got to consider to make sure that the infrastructure that's there, the, the wires primarily, but also the pipes are able to meet the other demands that we have to plan for um, that customers are relying on. So delivery system planning, that really is all the networks and wires that connect to homes and businesses that I've talked about. I'm not going to spend too much time going into it, but the one key piece that is really a, dis a differentiator, um, we don't just look at it as the electric system separate from the pipeline system anymore. Um, we have really taken a lot of steps to ensure that we are thinking about how we deliver energy to customers. Yes, we primarily use, we use wires to do the electrons. We use pipes to do the gas, um, but making sure we're not missing any opportunities thinking about Today, we deliver energy to customers. We've got to decarbonize that overall. Uh, and how can both of those systems really complement each other as we move forward? Oh, thanks, Darlene. Great. And so one, uh, one more piece. Uh, there's that fancy laser pointer. Cool. So one more piece on that. So really, this is not about how we plan for redelivery and planning. It's not how we plan for the generating resources. It really covers all of the infrastructure between the resource and the customer. Uh, it includes some DERs as well, but what's your distribution network need to look like? What's your transmission network need to support? Um, and same thing happens on the gas side of the house, right? Um, they're not worried about where the gas is generated, but where does it need to be delivered from? And what's the infrastructure have to be to support that from where it's produced to where it then is consumed by the customer? So clean energy transformation, uh, not just PSEs. The state of Washington, as most of us probably are familiar, uh, had passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act a few years ago. Um, and in terms of what that means, it's got a few overarching goals that are really helping to shape both how aggressively we need to plan uh, to clean, uh, to make sure we can deliver clean energy. Um, but it really is driving forward even faster than I think the economics would point us to. Uh, and, and I get the overarching goal, decarbonization is something we definitely want to focus and support. So some of the key milestones by 2025 will be coal free. By 2030, they'll be we, we're required to be carbon neutral. That really means that you're 80% clean, um, putting that in a, in a numerical term. And then by 2045, you need to be 100% clean. Um, and I think when this came out, I had a great conversation with our engineers. They said, how are we really going to get to 2045? How do you clean up 100% of it? It's a bit aspirational. I think there's still work uh, and opportunities for technology and to come along and help us get there. Uh, but it's a really key and important goal that we're all driving towards. Where is PSE at today? Um, by the end of 2025, PSE will be about 63% clean towards that target. So we're marching forward with that, um, but definitely not where, nowhere is as close to 80% as I'd like to see us. So we're, we're going to continue to push forward. There's still a lot of room to go to get all the way to 2030 before we try to get towards that 2045 goal. The other piece that's been really important is um, CETA sets the groundwork for us to make sure we are incorporating a number of other benefits to customers. So equity is one of the key pieces that we consider on every project that we we identify. What are other benefits? How are you going to uh, benefit and improve vulnerable populations or those that would be considered highly impacted or disadvantaged communities? Um, also looking at, in addition to public health and environmental, uh, the bullet on the bottom around energy security and resiliency ends up being a very, very important one. How are you maintaining the reliability? How are you improving the resiliency so customers have access to power even, even during storms? Um, or, or they're challenging weather environments. So it really sets, so to speak, a North Star uh, for us at PSC and our planning teams to ensure we can meet and can deliver on. Boiling this down into more specifics, um, and I'll come back to, if you remember, we've got around 5,000 megawatts of generation, a little over that, 
and around 5,000 megawatts of winter peak load today. Um, so our resource planning um, side of the house that we, we work very closely with, continue to look at how do we deliver power and achieve these CETA goals. And just getting to 2030, there's some really big um, takeaways that came out of the latest IRP. They're updating that now, but it continues to show we need a lot more resources, right? Um, PSO need to acquire somewhere between, I don't know, you see 4,000 megawatts on the on the bottom right of that graph uh, and potentially another 3,000 megawatts of DER. So more than doubling the amount of resource capability that we have so you can meet those clean energy targets. And yes, while that's aspirational, it really matters when you're planning the delivery system because it's hard to build a project, especially transmission lines, in less than 10 years. Uh, so we have a five to seven year window where we need to figure out what the plans are going to be to carry us towards that 2045 mark to ensure we can robustly deliver on that without losing ground on reliability and resiliency. So significant amounts of new resources to acquire. In addition to that, um, Today, across our entire service territory, we have uh, just about 100 megawatts in total of distributed resources, right? Primarily, most of that's solar, um, and that's about all. Uh, we, we don't, the sun doesn't shine in Seattle like it does on the eastern side of, of the state. Um, I, I envy that a lot of the times, but um, it means that it's really not as economic for customers to put up as much solar over on the west side of the mountain, the west of the Cascades and in this Puget Sound Basin. So we haven't seen a lot of that. So the other piece that helps um, us to achieve the clean energy goal is significantly adding um, distributed energy resources, right? Six times what we have by 2030. Now, thankfully, that can help the problem, especially if you get a target in the right place, because it helps offset the need for more infrastructure. Uh, but even at those higher 600 megawatt plus levels, it's still a small piece of the overall picture. It's an important one, but there's still a significant gap for our energy delivery infrastructure to meet as we continue to move forward with that. So what does that mean for us today and where we're going? Um, we are continuing to see a lot of challenges as we try to meet this de decarbonization goals overall. Uh, and that's driven by a number of factors. One of those really ties to the fact that we've got to go clean, um, but the other one ties to the fact that, that natural gas and electrification is something that is, is being required across energy policy in the state. Um, and something that also exacerbates the needs um, that we are going to see for both resources and both our, our delivery network. So dive into some more details on it. Um, one of the key pieces of information that we get and need to make sure the delivery system can support is the amount of, of demand we're going to have for power, right? So the, what we're showing here is what's the peak demand that we're expecting on PAC system over the next 20 years. Um, and the part that really is interesting to me, when we looked at this two years ago, uh, I'll focus on the picture on the left, all the stuff in blue, that's what was expected. So two years ago, that conversation would say, yeah, yeah, today you're at mm, 4,500, maybe 5,000 megawatts. You're going to add another five or 600 megawatts as you go, right? And I said, that's, that's not bad. That's a 10% increase over 20 years. I think we can manage that. That has dramatically shifted as we've looked at um, really increasing um, electric vehicle penetration, a lot of uh, e fleet penetration. We're seeing that across the board. It also has shifted as we've taken it into, into account really the effects of climate change um, and what that has meant specifically for both for winter and summer and the need for more power across both of those areas. So all of that means, boy, instead of serving a future system that's maybe 10% growth, you're going to jump closer to 6,500 or 7,000 megawatts, which is a significant uh, amount of level investment you're going to have to reinforce your delivery system. On the summer, same kind of conversation happening. Um, the part that's really interesting as the state and the industry looks at reducing the amount of natural gas that's used, partly to help decarbonize overall, um, it means that more people get AC much faster than you anticipate. As somebody replaces their natural gas furnace and they get a heat pump, oh, wow, they can cool their house, which is fantastic. And we're seeing a lot of that anyways. Um, so the penetration of AC and the impact on summer loading has been an extremely um, rapid paced challenge that frankly, it's been difficult to keep up with in some areas of the grid, right? Everybody has an AC system, so to speak, overnight, um, but the infrastructure necessary to support takes multiple years. So how can you better forecast for those, the penetration of AC where people are gonna be switching out and putting in heat pumps and make sure the grid can support it over time. So again, significant, we're on 4,000 megawatts of, of peak load in the summertime 
and that's expected to get up to 6,000 megawatts over the next 20 years. Uh, again, very significant amounts of growth that are expected. And the other key piece, it's an asterisk on the, on the slide we talked with stakeholders about, but it's a really important one to our team and the delivery system. This does not account for full electrification yet. So this is what we expect to happen today um, before you take into account that the potentially the natural gas system and you won't be able to use a natural gas system to heat your homes for space heating. Uh, and that adds another complicating factor, specifically on the winter peaking area, but it also has a ripple effect to that AC saturation piece on the summertime. So growth, growth, and more growth is really the summary um, here that we're seeing. And to put that into a finer point of kind of the challenges that are, are uh, well, they're ones that keep our planners up at night. They're ones that when I was finishing school, I was really excited to go solve for who, who renewable energy, and let's figure out how we make that happen. Um, but in today's world, how do you solve the fact that you probably maybe only have half the infrastructure that you need to really support these overall climate goals that you're trying to achieve? So zoom in on the wintertime. Um, as I mentioned, we don't include electrification in this particular forecast for the year yet. It's one we're working on. Um, we've done some, a range of numbers depending on how electrification happens. The numbers are there on the right. So today we've got about 5,400 megawatts of total load that we are expecting by 2040. You add some transportation load, right? This is just the load that uh, the transmission system needs to, to move around to transport power for other parties that are, we've contractually obligated with. DSM is some demand side management that helps offset some of the growth where you can use demand side management to shift the peak and do some of that. Um, we talked about EVs and climate change adding a significant amount of load. And if that was it, that would be a significant amount of load growth to deal with. Electrification really becomes a game changer for us. Um, it adds another, eh, I'll say 2,500 to 3,500 megawatts. So around 3,000 megawatts of additional load growth on top of that. When you turn that into real numbers for customers and real numbers for us, um, that could be somewhere between eight to $11 billion of investment necessary to add more transmission infrastructure, to add more distribution infrastructure, really to help offset those cold winter days where you wouldn't, you're not really gonna be able to rely on um, gas or the gas energy source to offset some of your winter peak demand. And those numbers are staggering. They're also ones that tend to be forgotten when we think about what, what the grid and what is really needed uh, to support from a rate payer standpoint and how do you keep rates manageable. The resources are thought about first, which is fantastic. They're an important piece, but you got to make sure you understand the uh, investment necessary to deliver that power to customers and make to maintain your reliability resiliency goals over time as well. So significant challenge in some ways, I'll say unprecedented. Um, it's one that when we sit there and even do back of the envelope math to try to figure out how you achieve that, you got to get started now. You're going to get a lot more flexibility and the kind of resources you're going to rely on are probably in different places. So a lot of challenges for our transmission system moving forward. How do you make it more flexible? How do you manage peak demand a different way? What are some of the technologies that you can do to achieve that? Um, but really, a, a in the mind of those who, any recent memory, really a historic challenge that the grid is going to be facing over the next 20 years to ensure we can decarbonize appropriately. So that's the challenge side, which is difficult. Um, we stepped back and said, how can you address that over, over the course of time? And really when we say, how can you address it? The important piece to us is how can you address it, but how do we also manage the cost of customers and try to make sure we can keep rates as low as we can while achieving those goals? Um, and part of that that we've identified is that there's been a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of work done over the years and specifically in the generation side uh, and so again, how do you optimize and manage our electric transmission distribution delivery system? When you think about decarbonization, if you only look at it from that lens, then you miss potential opportunities. Um, at PSC, we've got both a pipeline delivery system as well as a wire delivery system to deliver power to customers. In some ways, we're uniquely we're unique in that from the industry. There's not very many utilities that have both, so to speak, in, in one house or in within one company. Um, and so it's allowed us to to step back and take a look at how could you solve some of the problems we see on the delivery system by maximizing both of those systems. The pipelines are already there, as well as the wires are already there and serving those communities. What does that look like? How would that uh, align to different types of solutions? How can you use one to store energy for the other? How can you use one to peak share for the other? How does all of that optimize to decarbonize the grid in a way that may be more cost effective over the long run um, and potentially more resilient for customers that we move forward as well? 
So the our overall uh, direction, we want to continue to make sure we are a customer's clean energy partner of choice. And you want to leverage the assets that are there to do that so that you can keep our power not only reliable, but really affordable uh, while achieving those decarbonization goals for customers. Now this concept, um, I, I got some really wide eyes when we, we brought this up with our engineering staff. We're in a brainstorming session and, and someone had this epiphany moment. Well, are we really leveraging infrastructure the right way and what else can we do? Um, but it's not something we typically think about, right? We've got an electric design team that's focused on electric solutions. We got a gas planning team that's focused on gas solutions. And while we, we share lessons learned along the way, um, in the past, we typically haven't collaborated in solutions because you're trying to solve very different problems. So just uh, thinking about it differently from that perspective has already identified some interesting opportunities uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. And I think there's a lot more room to grow as we move forward with that. We've talked about this a little bit, so I'm gonna, I'll skip over initial time to, to get to some of the solutions we've looked at. And I think where there's some, some future challenges and what we're seeing in the Redmond area right now. Um, Part of what we've embarked on, and, and this was, was bleeding edge a few years ago, now it's become more commonplace, which is fantastic, is if you're gonna solve any kind of a de delivery system solution, so, hey, I've got a transformer, I've got a transmission line that's overloading, I don't have a capacity, um, what do I do? Um, typically, we'd go build another substation, right? You'd build another line, you'd make the next incremental improvement to the system. Today, you've gotta make sure you also evaluate all your other non-wire alternatives to do that. Can you put a local battery there? Can you put in solar panels? Can you do something else to, to help shape demand response and prevent energy efficiency, reduce the demand? Um, those are all things that we look at on projects. It takes a lot more time, and it's required our, our engineering staff uh, to be far more broad in the type of work they do. That, that I think they're far more economists than they care to admit in trying to crunch the numbers and figure out what, your, what the long-term um, net present value is and rate of recovery is gonna be on, on some of these projects. Um, but in today's world, it's the right answer because there are some lower cost solutions that can solve the problem and actually you can implement faster than some of the just the typical wired infrastructure. Again, coming back to the important part is how do you really manage affordability for customers? So over the past uh, five years now, we have been really piloting how do you use different kinds of grid solutions with non-wire alternatives and have, have identified some really fantastic examples. Um, Bainbridge Island is one of them that we're, we're putting together a whole complementary uh, battery and targeted demand response solution, in addition to some wired infrastructure um, to address problems. So we're continuing to see that. The piece that we've not dove into yet, because it really becomes a non-pipe and non-wire solution, and it takes people collaborating on both sides to make that happen, are some of these technologies in the lower left. How do you utilize fuel cells, electrolyzers? How do you manage customers end use with fuel switching using hybrid heat pumps? so that when you're on your cold winter days, you've got other options that have the longevity that you need. And that's really part of the key, the key challenge we found. The solutions that are on the table today, batteries are fantastic, but they don't work that long, right? Or you pay for every hour you want a battery to operate. And when you get into a multi-day or multi-week cold snap, that's when we're gonna see significant challenges to the grid if you fully electrify. Um, and, and batteries, at least today's batteries, um, lithium ion, maybe, maybe, um, flow batteries can help solve that in the bigger picture, but they're not the size or scale we'd need them to for that kind of longevity. Um, so are there other technologies we can use? Can we use like the pipeline system to do that? Can we help manage that on the, the customer side and still meet and or achieve our decarbonization goals? So the real big interesting part has been what can we share between our gas side of the business, and our electric side of the business, and where are there technologies that can overlap? Um, taking an energy agnostic approach don't presume the solution is electric. Don't presume it's gas. If we look at it from just delivering energy to customers, what's the best way that we can solve those problems and those examples? So let's take it to a case study of what some of the problems are. Um, and, and full transparency, I know what the problems are. We've not gotten to the point where we have all the solutions figured out. Um, we're really looking for some partnerships with, with different research uh, entities to help us shape what some of those are, at least in the long run. But we'll, we'll paint the picture of a case study um, and what we're seeing already in the city of Redmond, Washington. And I've got till I've got till around 11:50, right, Anamika? From a time check standpoint, she'll chime in later. Okay. Yeah, it's. I think it's 11:50. Yeah. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. So Sorry, from Redmond. Trying to unmute myself. Yes, we 11:45, 11:50 is fine. Yep. Perfect. Okay, sounds great. 
So from a Redmond standpoint, um, downtown Redmond, Redmond, Washington, right? The home of Microsoft over uh, just north of the Bellevue area, city of Redmond. Um, great area seeing a tremendous amount of growth that's happening. Um, probably more growth than we've seen in that area in the, in the last 20 years is expected to happen in the next four or five. And instead of being a winter problem that's facing it, which we typically build infrastructure for, because of the intensive heat growth that we're seeing, summer becomes the driving need from a delivery standpoint. So today in Redmond, you've got about six substations that serve that area. Um, and on the picture on the right, all those little push pins, those are all individual load requests that we've seen uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Usually we'd see maybe five to 10, not the, not the 30 plus that we're, we're, we're dealing with right now. Um, thankfully, we've got a pretty robust distribution network, but um, our, our capacity limit in the area is around just over 100 MBA, 100 megawatts that you can serve. What's been interesting is the kind of requests that we've been receiving. You know, typically, they, we'd have a lot more multifamily, mixed use, um, and some commercial, right? As, as Microsoft expands and SpaceX expands that area, um, you've got Meta and Verizon that are dramatically expanding that zone as well. So the high tech is, is still alive and well, and they're expanding, which is fantastic. But we're seeing a lot, but even at the load levels, you're seeing um, another 10 megawatts, so to speak, from the high tech zone, another 10 to 16 megawatts from your mixed multifamily and mixed use. Light rail has finally come to Redmond. So the electrification is really driving a significant share of the growth. That's the part that's different. And those powers are far peakier than normal. Um, take a light rail line, you get a really high loading, but it's only for 15 minutes. Right, it's not that long. Maybe something you can manage in a different way, but still, it's a very high peak you have to manage. So that's some of the light rail issues that we've seen. The part that's really surprising recently is the amount of um, electrification we're seeing on the fleet side. Now we've we've worked with a, a number of different companies, many of which probably you know the names of, um, that are electrifying their fleets. Uh, it's happening very rapidly for some. Some of those are still are are still waiting in the wings to see how it all plays out for those other companies, but. Um, it's been very interesting to see how many um, want to pull the trigger in a short period of time. And also how unknown their usage profile is. Hey, I'm on an EV fleet, whether it's a UPS, a post office, right? An Amazon or a Microsoft or others, they're all looking to electrify. The challenge is how often are they going to charge? What's that look like? How can you manage that demand? What kind of flexibility is there in that? Um, and really the amount of electrification that we're seeing in Redmond eclipses or almost overshadows the rest of the growth that's expected over the next 10 years, which is which is a first for PSE. The other part that's really interesting, um, and it's driving up a lot of the megawatts for the mixed use facilities, people are putting EV chargers left and right. Um, you've got whole buildings where instead of having, you know, two or four or 10 EV chargers, their entire parking garage has EV charging every single stall. Interesting question right now, even happening on the industry, how do you model that? What are the assumed profiles that you use? How much are people going to come to work and all want to charge at the same time and exacerbate what the grid can support? So one of the other key challenges we have in Redmond is how do you manage that over time? What does that look like? Getting to, uh, so over time, that's around 50 megawatts, give or take, uh, that we have fully approved and another uh, 10 to 20 that we're looking at uh, that's been requested. So a significant amount of load that's being asked for in the Redmond area. And the reality is it strains the grid in that area. So coming back to that same piece, um, we've got uh, as a substation group, about four major substations that serve the area. Each of those have about 25 MVA transformers when you look at, at, at our, our planning targets and triggers. Today in 2022, we're, we're 20 megawatts heavy. So we've got 20 megawatts of capacity there to help manage that. In 10 years, um, in 10 years with EVs, you're looking at a 70 megawatt shift. And that is substantial. So those, the last substation built in that area probably happened uh, 15 years ago. Um, first thing about building three or four more substations in the next 10 years is a daunting task. And considering that a typical substation takes six to eight years to build, it is, it is a challenge and one that really is unprecedented in some of these urban areas. And if you've been to Redmond, you'll see that every single square block is taken up with multifamily and there's uh, multifamily high rises, right? Six to 10 stories tall. And there's not a lot of space on the ground to put significant amounts of substation infrastructure. So more needs that we're seeing and really being driven by electrification uh, for transportation. Those EVPs I talked about. The other piece that's really interesting um, is we've got a robust electric delivery system in the urban area. When we think about it, how can you leverage the gas system that's there? Um, the gas pipeline system 
is is flush with capacity. And especially in the summertime, that's not what typically when it's used. So you've got an asset that can deliver a fuel of some kind. The question is, how can you make that fuel renewable enough? How can you make it and decarbonize it? And are there opportunities to leverage that pipeline, whether it's for storage, whether you're doing energy shifting using fuel cells, and how do those solutions really compare or contrast with an all electric solution? Um, the question comes back to how do you manage cost for that as you move forward? How do you optimize the cost for that as you move forward? Um, and then maybe more importantly, how does that change the resilience framework for customers? So um, the other piece uh, that, that we've seen in the Redmond area, when we have a storm that goes through, you're, you're talking to your, your dispatchers and then the, the field crews that are driving out there trying to pick power up. It's amazing how many lights are on even when you have a storm and the power's out. Because the vast majority of the folks in that area um, have renewable, I have, sorry, I have natural gas generators. So they really rely on that natural gas system to supply energy to them and to become more resilient. So how do you maintain that resiliency with the pipeline system? And is there a way you could leverage that to help offset some of the capacity growth that we're seeing moving forward? So some significant and really daunting challenges. Um, I, I know we've sat around the room and proposed many different ways you can solve this, but really interesting opportunity, I think, for the gas delivery system to help utilize some of that capacity that's there to help address these loads. Um, some of them are really peaky, some of them aren't. Um, and I think there's still a lot unknown about what the true usage profile is going to be for these EV fleets. Um, even sitting down and talking with the UPSs and the Amazons of the world, what, what is your usage profile really going to look like? Well, in the holiday season, they can tell us it's on all the time. They're charging all the time. I get that. I said, okay, winter peak, got it. What about the summertime? Eh, there's a lot more questions there. Depends on how busy things are. Depends what the delivery network really looks like. Um, so there's still a lot, I think, of, of assumptions being made on what an EV fleet really has to do and what kind of load profile they're going to be using. So that's part of the interesting opportunity in Redmond. Um, th this kind of scenario, boy, it it's one that I'd hope we wouldn't have to address for probably another five or 10 years while we let uh, technology and other things come to come into play and some of the policy in the state shape, shape up. But we're seeing it today. And the need is truly here today. Um, we're trying to figure out how we, we even get to 2025 and what some of our, our uh, our short-term solutions are going to be to address this while we can work on these long-term reinforcements that are needed and trying to balance the amount of infrastructure that you really have to have to invest in and develop to serve these loads over time. So that's the electric system on the gas delivery system. And we just went over this with the team last week and they said, you know, we're good to go. You could pull as much gas as you want from that area, um, especially in the summertime, you've got an ample supply of energy. The question is, how do you decarbonize that over time? Um, um, especially in downtown Redmond, Redmond and those are two of the big hot growth pockets. Um, you've got high pressure pipelines that roll all the way into that area. So um, you can definitely push a lot of fuel that way if you'd want to. Um, the question is, how do you utilize every electric grid in the best way? How do you manage? How do you dispatch it? How do you compare a fuel cell type solution to an electric grid solution? And how do you balance that from a resiliency standpoint and others? So for Redmond, this is as far as we've gotten. We've got the problem, we've got the optionality. I think what we're looking at is what are the challenges that we're gonna have to face in the near future and where are there opportunities to really partner with academia to help shape some of that. Um, I say that because I don't think the technology that we have in place today and maybe some of the, the modeling tools we have in place today are sufficient to get those answers. We have to, we have to estimate, I'm not gonna say guess, but we have to estimate, right? Could use good engineering judgment, to try to determine what the right solution is going to be um, but there's a lot of room for improvement in how you optimize and how you model some of these systems as you move forward. So we're seeing a need for us to help change how we plan our delivery system infrastructure. Um, a lot of that ties to the energy, the energy supply. We're going to have more distributed resources to deal with who great we're ready for that. It's got to be cleaner and that exacerbates the load growth. We're seeing that at Redmond, but we're also seeing it in other places. Um, the other piece that we're having to adapt to in rapid fashion is really customer and stakeholder expectations. They want to be part of the solution, which is great. The question is, can they deliver on that? Are they really willing to change and switch and modify how they use energy to help the grid? Um, and, and what's that worth to them from a customer standpoint? So same question we've always faced, but but really with this kind of a, of a need, in, even in localized urban areas, um, it allows us to do more innovative things with those customers if they want to partner with us on them. The other piece that's been interesting is um, some customers, especially those that are, are on the data centers or in the EV fleets, 
they have sustainability goals that are even more aggressive than the state of Washington, right? They want to be clean by 2030 in some cases um, or earlier. Um, so trying to get a better understanding of what green means for them and what their sustainability goals are and how it does or doesn't align with ours and what we can provide is a really interesting challenge as, you, as we talk to them and work with them. So again, a lot more engagement with the customers and the stakeholders. From a technology standpoint, um, one of their challenges is keeping up with it. Um, technology can change and customers can adopt that technology at really a, a faster pace than we can build infrastructure to support it. So how do you maintain a reliable and resilient grid while customers adopt heat pumps that can happen in, in right in a, in a three month period or, or faster, depending on how long the permits take. And that can dramatically shift what you, how, how your local distribution system is impacted and how do you manage that over time? Same thing with electrification. We're seeing that Redmond already. How do you keep up with the technology and what people are doing? That really ties back to the emerging demand for EVs and electrification. And, and what's the utility's role to educate customers on how that works and really to develop programs um, to help shape how the power is used over time instead of just building infrastructure. So this is an opportunity for us as a utility to be proactive in how we engage with customers and specifically those that are large users like EV fleets um, to understand what the flexibility is because at the end of the day, it's a really high cost to, to significantly upgrade the infrastructure of the electric grid if we're just going to go with full electrification. And, and that cost eventually will be borne by the rate payers have to pay it. And I would love to see our rates in Washington state continue to stay low and not look like what they are in California. Um, so what are some, some really creative solutions we can do using the infrastructure that we have and leveraging that to get there? One of the gaps that we found um, as we move forward to this is, is the planning tools, right? Um, and I think this will tie to a few research opportunities, but um, today we have a hard time modeling this. Uh, you model a peak system, that's great. We know how to use it, um, but we don't model how they interact with each other, how our gas system, how they interact with it, or even our resource system. So I'll talk about that a little bit on what I think are some of the, the upcoming research opportunities that that uh, really the industry, utility industry is interested in, PSE is for sure. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a case study for other utilities to, to, to leap off of as we move forward. So one of those is around how do you optimize what the right solution is? And yes, economic optimization has been around for years. I did some of that back in my research days. Um, but really, it gets back to how do you study the system that's an integrated grid? If I use a different way, if I use a fuel cell, for example, to shift energy between one, one's the electric system and a gas system, how does that ripple effect to the resource supply that you're trying to serve to meet power? What's the economic optimization for that? And how do you balance in um, end use control for customers trying to shape how their power looks and appropriately plan for that and appropriately dispatch for that? The other piece that I think is, is, is an important piece for utilities, it wasn't as much in academia, but the, the answer is what's going to be the lowest customer impact from a rate standpoint? How do you keep rates affordable while maximizing resilience? Um, and, and really, that's where the economics drive the decision making. Um, part of what I, I really appreciate about the research institution is their ability to look past that. Here's where the economics drive us to today. If we are going to almost double the amount of power that's needed from a peak standpoint, what's the next technology barrier preventing us from having the next economic solution that we could think about? Where does that land? What should we be developing to get there? Um, how much the fuel cells have a part to play? I'll put it as it's, it's a question. We've got pipes that can store tremendous amounts of fuel whether it's gas, whether that's ammonia, whether that's hydrogen, lots of different way, ways to go from that standpoint. What's the next step that can get us there versus just building that infrastructure where we have to meet a peak demand uh, that is really underutilized for most of the time? And while the questions I'm bringing up are really not, many are not new, stepping back and looking at it from an energy agnostic perspective, saying we're trying to deliver energy using both of those systems, what's the best way we do it? Um, can lead to some different solutions that maybe we wouldn't thought about if we were looking at it just from an electric or a gas system separated. So that's another piece. And really, what are the technologies to do that? Um, and on the technology side, uh, again, we don't think about it that way very often, but what are those combined energy technologies that could be used to shift energy between the two and leverage the assets that you've already got in, in, in the field, so to speak, the pipes and wires that are there? So that's one whole area, I think, of research that continue to be explored and one that we're interested in and looking at really from an urban standpoint in the urban area and probably some others as well. The other one is how do you model that, right? Um, I sit down with our resource planning folks on a regular basis. And they've got some fantastic models that look at 
your economic dispatch by hour and what your lowest resource cost is going to be, which is fascinating. And they come to me and I said, that's great. I just need the peak winter number or the peak summer number. Okay. Um, as we move forward, you got to study what the integrated grid looks like because the cost for the delivery system potentially could eclipse. They could over overshoot the cost you're going to pay to buy resources, which is kind of scary in some, some ways. So making sure that you are doing what you can to optimize how your delivery system investments have been made um, is going to help shape what the total cost of customers are going to be. So that's one piece that still has, that there's still a lot of room to go from that standpoint and how we model and how we study it. The other piece is when you add pipelines in, how do you look at that? I've, we've got great synergy models that look at electric system and the gas system, but those models don't interact. Um, and you can make some crude assumptions. The big question is how long, uh, how long can we do that? Today we probably can, but moving forward, how long is it, can we go before we don't, we have to account for that system interaction? It's really suboptimal what we have today. And is that good enough for today? Is that good enough for five or 10 years? Or do we need to be setting that now? And I think this really gets into a ripple effect of as soon as you start switching a lot of your energy, let's say in the city of Redmond over to a gas or a pipeline fueled source, you're going to shift your load flow dramatically. How do you study that? How do you look at that and account for what the resource impacts are going to be upstream on your transmission grid and otherwise? Uh, so it leads to probably a lot further need for studying what your T transmission and distribution system can provide, um, how storage interplays with that, and then how your gas supply is then affected all the way up to, the, to, your, to your upper end on, on what's going to be used for resources all the way down. So again, gaps in what the models can study today um, that we continue to see. And I've talked about like a little bit about this, but um, the other piece I think is really important is how do you quantify the benefits of that? How do you measure what resilience is today? and what resilience is going to be in the future um, using these different complementary pipes and wires. So we're going to decarbonize. We get that. We're all on board with it, and I think it's a great overall solution. What are you going to lose if you go full electrification? What's your resilience look like? How are people going to really uh, provide the backup generation of their homes for those that can afford to do it? And for those that can't, how are you going to then support local community centers or those areas where they have access to key facilities? And what do you use as a backup, and how long does that last? Um, so there's, I think, a lot of work on the theoretical part to figure out what pure electrification looks like versus what today's system looks like versus what an optimized, decarbonized solution looks like. That could be from a societal cost, cost of rate pairs, um, as well as what your overall um, carbon output for some of those different solutions and how do you use that to achieve climate goals. And I think the last piece is how do you model what customers are really going to do um, I talked a little bit earlier, an EV fleet, what's the load profile for an EV fleet really look like? What's a managed profile look like? Um, and how do you balance through that? Same thing goes for a, a number of other customer uses that we just don't have a lot of experience with because it's going to be new. Hybrid heat systems being one of those. Um, also, we're seeing a lot of influx of hydrogen electrolyzers and, and in some ways how flexible, in other ways how inflexible they are in terms of what they want, they want for power as we move forward. So really a lot of opportunity in the technology space to understand how the technologies help solve some of these problems. Um, a lot of opportunity in how we can model these systems and how much they need to interact. Um, and PNNL and others have taken some steps in looking at that at a high level. Um, but it's important to you that we have models that can look at it all the way down to the distribution level. Because the cost for those distribution lines, the cost for those substations, they add up to in many ways being even more um, than the resources that you're trying to purchase to meet the clean energy goals in the first place. And so with that, I'm around 11.45. I will, um, I will pause there and see if we have questions, thoughts, comments, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Jen. 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 Thank you. Hopefully there is no echo now. Okay. No this echo now. Okay, thank you, Jens. <laughs> it was horrible to hear my own echo. Presentation <laughs> 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 today. Let's have a uh, very interesting talk. It was great to learn about how things are, um, you know, changing and what are the new challenges. How research can contribute to it. So, thanks so much for a very informative <clears throat> talk. I'll open it up for questions now. So, we'll start with students. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Hi, Jen. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and the research opportunities. They look pretty great to me, great to all of us. So I just have a question. Uh, probably it's twofold. 
as you mentioned, like EV fleets uh, that could add more loads uh, to the system and they can also bring the DC fast chargers in the system that accounts for more three phase. And then considering they would be off peak charging where they could bump up the off peak load, would the cost for the utility look same in the future and have you plan for that? That would be one question. And on the other hand, uh, talking more about the resilience, for instance, they are more load adding in the system also from the perspective of uh, the heat waves that we had last year where there was multiple rolling outages. Uh, how is utility planning to work for those resilience, for instance, all of them happening at once and considering the cost and the resource both, both being very high for the resilience, is utility ready for that? I mean, are, are they ready for the planning for that purpose? I'll start with the last one. The heat wave, absolutely ready. But without a doubt, that's great. I think the um, <laughs> the challenge is, is we fared really well from a heat dome perspective when we had that high heat. Um, big questions are how, from a transmission standpoint, it worked pretty well. There's going to be some gaps that we'll have to close. One of the biggest issues we found when looking at resilience and, and high heat is in some ways how undersized or how our standards didn't account for that, right? Um, standards that were laid out 10, 20 years ago, all of our local transformers um, they assume that you're going to cool down at night and you're not going to be hitting over over triple digit temperatures on a regular basis. That's what Las Vegas would plan to and not Pacific Northwest. So um, really updating our standards and trying to get ahead of how we can proactively identify transformers that are going to overload potentially in the next heat wave. Um, we, we've stood up a whole multi-million dollar program to to do exactly that, to minimize the onesie twosie outages. So in the last heat dome, our system overall fared fairly well, but we had we we caught we actually kicked off our whole emergency storm session. Um, from a storm standpoint, we had a lot of small distribution transformers, right? They have 25, 50, 75 kilowatt transformers um, and multiple outages across the board. In fact, we even ran out of transformers that we had stocked and had to use some non-standard sizes. So um, that was one of our key takeaways from the heat dome. So from a zoning standpoint, that's that's a really important one and one that we're addressing. Um, separating out to the electric vehicle fleet loading. And you mentioned charging the off-peak. I'd hope they charge in the off-peak. Every electric vehicle fleet we've had that's requested power thus far, they want to charge all day long. In fact, their rolling plan is they will send delivery trucks out on a staggered basis, and they will then come back and charge. I uh, haven't from the Postal Service yet, so maybe that'll change with them, but um, it is a very consistent charging pattern they're expecting to be used. And they'll say, well, actually fall and spring and summer, there might be some flexibility, but you get us to the holiday season, and they're going to be rolling trucks in and out as fast as they can and utilizing those chargers. They don't want to overbuild the chargers. Um, but but we're seeing it actually exacerbate our typical peak load profile, right? Cold winter morning, six, seven, eight, nine in the morning. Um, I, I'm worried we're going to have an even more extreme peak in some of those urban areas where those fleets are at. So how do you manage that? Um, and in some ways, the customer may not be willing to manage themselves. So how do you then plan your utility infrastructure so you can store enough power to, to, to peak shave during those events? Thanks, Jens. We have a question online. John, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi, Jens. This is John Gibson at Avista. Um, great presentation and uh, brilliant insight. I, I've been articulating around here that the natural gas system could be leveraged to improve resiliency as well as doing some uh, demand peak offsets during the summer with utilization of fuel cells. So it was great to see you articulate a similar mm -hmm. idea. The question I have is, have you looked at any of these natural gas fuel cells as Puget Sound and, and found products that they felt the maturity was there or uh, capabilities they're interested there? We've got a group looking at that right now, John, and and, and uh, appreciate you know the insights. Insights are aligned. That's great. I'll say great minds think alike. So I appreciate the feedback on that. Um, I, I think there's opportunity there. There's from a natural gas standpoint, from a hydrogen fuel cell standpoint. Yes, we're seeing we're we're seeing some from product maturity. The question is scale. How confident it can really work above one, two, three megawatts, and is that really realistic or not? That's part of the question that we're asking. I think it goes hand in hand with for sure. We've got electrolyzer technology that's commercially viable. Um, for sure, you can take hydrogen, you can run it through a turbine, and we can generate power that way. So that's the, well, I would say quick and dirty, but that's probably too much of a pun for now. But quick and non-dirty way to do it, um, I, the, the challenge we're really having is that may, even if we can make that meet our decarbonization targets, 
Um, that's not enough for the sustainability targets that some of the big big tech folks are using. They don't want to burn anything if they don't have to, even if it's hydrogen. So we're working through that piece by piece, but I think there's a lot more um, product maturity happen on the fuel cell side. So I don't know the answer to that, but I think there's that there's definitely going to be an area that is going to need some continued focus. And just uh, just a quick question: Are you going to be at EEI next week? I am not going to make it to EEI next week. No. And do you go into the office at in Bellevue? Yes. Do you mind if I drop by on Wednesday? Sorry to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be there. I'm out of town, so I'm not going to be there on Wednesday. But tell you what, John, you and I can connect and, and, and happy to get together and chat more. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, so in terms of the, the 2030 carbon neutrality goal, um, I, I understand the, the one side of the equation, which is just produce less carbon. What are the tools available on the other side of the equation in terms of carbon reduction? Uh, well, at, at the end of the day, that all ends up being, um, well, so you're going you're to reduce energy, reduce load, right? So reduce energy demand overall. Energy efficiency plays a key part in that. Um, that being said, in, in, in the IRP study, it looks at this pretty, pretty regularly. PSC is already maximizing everything. Every, everything that's technical, we're maximizing the technical potential of what's available from an energy efficiency reduction standpoint. Um, so those are, when I say maximizing, they, we, the, they look at every possible technology that can reduce energy demand and make it more efficient, right? Home appliances, insulation, windows, et cetera. So um, before those didn't always pencil and say they're economic with the climate, uh, the decarbonization goals, they are fully included. So after you factor all of that in, um, this is still the load profile that you're left with to, to help support. Um, so from a decarbonization standpoint, unfortunately, um, carbon offsets, so to speak, don't work in the long range for CETA. It's, it's, it's allowed in 2030 um, for a portion of it, but it's not allowed by 2045. So hedging your bets on that doesn't work. Um, the only other thing is going to be lo local solar generation. So more DERs, right? And the more customers you can sign up to a DER program, great. Um, or a community solar type program um, work from a from a, a CETA law standpoint, but otherwise those are those are the tools in the bucket that are allowed by what CETA has set out for us. Let me put it that way. Thank you. Great question. Thanks. Um, yeah, Jeff or Jeffrey. Jeff. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks again for. Uh, I'll pile on to everybody else's great job on the presentation. On, uh, I have a question on storage. So on the um, chart that you showed with 2045, I saw quite a bit of storage in that. And I'm assuming part of that is for uh, handling variability of, of your resources. Uh, but I'm also curious if you're also looking at storage as a, a non-wires alternative for transmission resilience or, or you know, other or delivery system resilience um, issues. And, and if so, what kind of storage duration are you guys looking at? Great question. So um, the energy storage identified in that slide, that was just to, to meet the resource need. To your point, how can we then leverage it to address T&D or transmission uh, needs in, in reality? Um, so we did a bunch of pilot studies to look at exactly that. What's a large scale transmission capacity? How can non wire alternatives solve that? Uh, the findings that were kind of were a little bit surprising even to us. Today, there's a sweet spot economically that works. So if you have a reliability issue, batteries don't work that well because your one, two or four hour batteries just are insufficient, right? You're you're your fastest outage is four to six hours. And for transmission, typically it's it's eight to eight to twenty-four hours. So uh, batteries just aren't sufficient from that standpoint. From a purely capacity standpoint, once you get above 20, 30 megawatts of peak demand, um, uh, the economics of batteries just don't pencil compared to your typical TND infrastructure. So there's a sweet spot in between. That's what we really targeted batteries for. Um, I think there's still a lot to your point. Um, those batteries will most likely be focused on how do you manage the stochastic nature of the generation resources? How do you manage your cross-gauge regional, regional paths and your flows? But there's a couple of locations where I may be able to help, um, particularly probably in storm events, et cetera, but it, it doesn't meet the, I'm coming back to how do you meet the NERC requirements um, for your TND? And based on, because there's such a long durations, batteries as of right now just aren't economic um, at those longer durations. What we are targeting right now is, is a two and a four hour battery. We've already RFP'd for those. Um, I'm sure we'll be, I, well, sure. I'm hoping that we'll be purchasing a, a large amount of those. The part that's more impactful is how do you manage those to adjust your flow so you don't exacerbate existing problems of transmission grid? And how does that operational need compare to uh, 
to the operation need to manage the stochastic nature of the grid. And then think about where your future resources are going to go because all the natural gas fired plants you have really are going to go away or not be able to be utilized without that extra hundred dollars per megawatt hour um, see the penalty on top of it so that pushes your economics towards very different solutions but anyways long way to answer but um, hopefully helps give you a sense of, of where we where batteries are fitting today um, and where we where they really align with the TND infrastructure plans yep great thank you um, any other questions yep go ahead how do you plan resource adequacy for demand responses or other solar and battery resources? For example, if you said that there is a significant portion of demand response, how do you know what percentage of that is going to be available all the time? Great question. Um, that's one my planners debate on a regular basis. How much can you rely on it when there's no other backup? So demand response is easy to rely on when you say, great, what's my next alternative? I may fire up an, an out of market economic uh, out of market generator that isn't the econ best economic dispatch, but at least the lights stay on. Um, it's a different threshold when you're saying, great, you're at the tail end of Bainbridge Island. There are no other wires there. How do I design a system to rely on demand response? And, and there's been a lot of studies to look at that. Um, we are in the process right now of piloting that. So one, you got to have a platform like a virtual power plant platform that can dispatch it accordingly. Um, and part of what that platform is, and the thus far, at least the the developers um, that we are that we are going to be working with, that's come through the RFP process, they'll give you a, a live look with the confidence factor of what you can get at least in the next hour. The question that our planners still have is, is that enough to rely on? Uh, and until somewhat that's proven, um, I think it'll work great when it's not a holiday. But I'm really concerned if it's New Year's. New Year's Eve and people are going to say, great, I know I can save five cents, but my mother-in-law's in town and there's no way I'm turning the heat down right now. Um, so those are some of the challenges that face a planner. Uh, and so I, I think we're going to start with places where the impact to customers, if it doesn't work, isn't ideally isn't going to be noticed or be minimal, minimal risk before and gain some confidence in that before you scale it up to being, so to speak, the last line uh, of, of defense, so to speak, that we use um, to serve, to keep the lights on. We have one final question. Anyone? Okay. So, Jens, let me ask you a question. So, what will be your um, um, maybe key pointers for our graduate students doing research in this area? What would you want them to uh, be thinking about all the time as you are seeing the challenges our industry is seeing? I'm going to say think big picture and don't get too focused in one area of the research. Um, it is a team effort to solve these problems. And don't assume that the policies that are put into place are right. Uh, I think challenge what they might be. If you find a better solution, make the case for that. Even if you got to reach across to your mechanical engineering partners and figure out how some of those pieces work. At the end of the day, we're delivering energy to customers. It's not all about electrons. It's not all about grid resiliency or security. Those are all important aspects. But what's the best way you can optimize the cost for customers? And, and that ends up being the question that shapes what the industry does. Thank you so much, Jens, uh, for very uh, engaging uh, discussion today and for an insightful presentation. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> our talk, our seminar for today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.